Today we have an absolutely golden opportunity for, to hear from the source. We're fortunate to have with us three women in positions of power and influence in the, in the news media to tell us what they feel and what their experience is and what their views are about whether or not there is any degree of misogynist, misogyny in the Australian media and what kind of impact that might have on news agendas, news stories, and then, in their view, on the reporting of violence against women. Our first speaker is a woman who actually uh, has had a lot to do with this because she uh, had a very pivotal part in the Herald Sun's Take a Stand campaign, which you probably remember about a year ago, stood up and said it got the, a lot of major male leaders, like the head of the armed forces, uh, the police commissioner, the head of the AFL, the Lord Mayor, to get them to say, we're taking a stand um, against violence against women. We men are saying enough is enough and we're going to call out other men on their sexist behaviour and attitudes and, and words. And the Herald Sun at that time started running really well socially contextualised stories on violence against women. Instead of it just being was domestic violence has risen, it was, it was a woman killed by a man and he was her intimate, intimate partner and we will go and talk to domestic violence workers and people who are relevant to it to get the real story that this is an ep ep epidemic. So Ellen Wynette, with her, about whom I've just been speaking, is the national political editor for Murdoch's largest daily capital city newspaper, The Herald Sun. She's a Walkley award-winning journalist who's also received a News Corporation's Global Excellence Award and a Keith Welsh Award for outstanding contribution to journalism. She's worked as a associate editor at The Herald Sun and head of news and deputy editor of The Sunday Herald Sun, chief reporter of The Sunday Herald Sun, section editor of The Saturday Herald Sun, and before that, she held senior reporting roles in investigations and politics at the Herald Sun in various positions, various positions on the Hobart Mercury and the Launceston Examiner. She's covered four federal elections, the Black Saturday bushfires, an assassination attempt on Jose Ramos Horta in East Timor, the Cronulla race riots, the Bali bombings, the Port Arthur Massacre and Martin Bryant Court case, and she's the author and editor of three books and a documentary. So you can see she's had a really slack life. <laughs> Our second speaker, yeah, on the far side is Kate Tawney, who's director of ABC News. Now, Kate started this position in early 2009, which puts her at the head of a news force of 1,100 journalists and production staff working from some 70 locations in Australia and around the world. This division is Australia's leading independent news and current affairs source, providing content for three television channels and seven radio networks, as well as running continuous coverage on ABC Online and 24-hour service channel ABC News 24. Kate has a background in the field as a radio and TV reporter, producer, bureau chief, executive producer and editor. Um, the ABC, as you know, really led digital journalism in this country. It was really ahead of the pack in terms of having a very strong online presence from the very beginning. And as the digital um, innovation has revolutionised the media business, she is leading an executive team which is reshaping news gathering and reimagining news delivery, uh, keeping the ABC at the forefront of changing audience demands with the rapid expansion of online and mobile news services and the launch of cross-platform teams and interactive storytelling. Our final speaker is Patricia Cavallis, who's Victorian editor and bureau chief of The Australian. After covering three federal elections in which the federal government changed hands and the subsequent Labor administration changed prime ministers, Patricia was appointed to this position in 2011, where she manages a large team of journalists and she's responsible for driving the paper's news coverage. She regularly writes on national affairs, including welfare, employment, social issues, Indigenous affairs, and she appears on a range of political programs, including Channel 10's Meet the Press, Sky's Australian Agenda, ABC Radio and ABC TV Television, The Drum. This year, she's been a fill-in presenter for the ABC 774 Drive Time program. Patricia was commended in the 55th Walkley Awards and she won the inaugural Wallace Brown Young Achievers Award for Press Gallery Journalism. Um, the, this, is, uh, this talk is going to be is recorded and so you have to wait until the microphone gets to you, otherwise we won't get a recording. Thank you. We won't get a recording of your question. So if I could start with Ellen Wynette and, um, and invite her to give us her comments. Oh, thank you, Gail. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming out to hear us today. I, I very much welcome the opportunity to have this discussion and I'd like to give you some information, if I could please, about the Herald Sun and how we operate. 
Um, and I think, I think the issues that we're talking about today can be broken into two strands. And the first of those is how women get on inside the newsroom and then how the newspaper and how we put together our news agenda. So I'll start by taking us inside. Um, at the Herald Sun, we have two editors. One is a woman, one is a man. The Herald Sun is the biggest selling daily newspaper in Australia. It's edited Monday to Saturday by Damon Johnson, and I work directly for him. The Sunday Herald Sun is the second largest selling Sunday newspaper in Australia, and that paper is edited by Jill Baker. Uh, those combined newsrooms employ a little over 200 people in the editorial department, and just under half of those currently are women. We have four news producers who run our news desk. Two of those are women, and our homepage editor at heraldsun.com.au is a female. We have a number of senior female reporters and columnists. Um, some of the names may be familiar to you, Fiona Hudson, Susie O'Brien, Carly Crawford, Ruth Lampard, Shelley Hadfield. I hold the job as Gail said as national political editor. I've been head of news or effectively deputy editor to both papers. And over a two year period, I edited those papers for five months. And I stepped away from that work because I want to get back into the field and report stories. The uh, reporter that works for me in Canberra is a woman and the reporter that handles um, national politics for the Sunday newspapers, uh, the Metropolitan Papers, is a woman, Samantha Maiden. Um, and I have to say that I have never felt the presence of a glass ceiling uh, when I've been working in journalism. I never felt that there was any role or any job that was out of reach to me because I was a woman. I never felt my opinion mattered less because I was female. My salary, I believe, is commensurate with what men earn at the same levels. I have direct access to the editor and direct access and input into editorial decision making as any senior reporter should, male or female. And I, I give you my personal experience, I suppose, as an illustration of the point that, that I believe the Herald Sun is an absolute meritocracy, that if you're good, you'll get on. It won't matter if you're male or female, young, old, or parent. If you're a good worker, if you're a good journalist, you're just gonna do well at the Herald Sun. Um, female voices are heard and valued, I believe. Um, I just looked over the past week. Um, uh, women's bylines appeared in the front page of the Herald Sun five times in the last seven days. Men's bylines appeared six times in that same period. Um, the female journalists who made the front page did so for no reason other than they had the best story of the day. And it, it seems to me that underlying this, this debate is, is a view that a male editor would make a particular news decision that a female editor might not, and that a female editor would produce a different newspaper to that that a man would, and I simply don't believe this is true. Uh, editors make decisions based on what they believe their readers want, and it's not a, a feminine or masculine agenda. Uh, it's reader-driven, and I, I would dare anyone to find a difference or choose a paper that I had edited and compare it to a paper that my male boss had edited, I, I just don't think you'd see any difference between those two papers. Um, our readership is a mirror of society, that is that the number of females is just slightly higher than the number of males, so a little over 50% of our readers are women, we're not blind to who our, our readers are. So if I have a look at what drives our news agenda, firstly we at the Herald Sun seek to be where our readers are. We give them the stories they want. So that's politics, crime, lifestyle, sport, food, weather, business, fashion. Um, and so we reflect our readers, but we also lead them. And I think our most obvious leadership example in, in recent times is the Take a Stand campaign, which we launched on July 22 last year. And that was our campaign to call out um, violence against women and children. Uh, we launched that on July 22 last year. We gave it seven news pages on day one, including the front page and a two-page editorial. We've since run seven front page stories on Take a Stand, 24 full news pages inside, dozens of other stories, editorials, opinion pieces, and we've funded two court cases on behalf of survivors of family violence. Um, and we did, as Gail said, kick that off with a, a front page um, featuring men because we believed that we needed to turn this debate completely around. This was not a women's issue, this was a man's issue. So we felt we needed men to say that. So uh, we pulled together the Premier, Dennis Napthine, the Lord Mayor, Robert Doyle, the then AFL Chief, Andrew Dimitriou, Police Commissioner, Ken Lay. And Ken Lay's done a lot of very good work on this and we took our original lead from him. And um, before we did that, we spoke to Fiona McCormack and um, many of the support groups and, and took advice from them as to what we could do. Um, I knew we had a great opportunity here and I really want to make the most of it and just made sure we got it right. Um, 
and what we sought to do, because we're a, a, a mass market paper, is we have a very loud voice and a very strong impact on the community. And we wanted to use that loud voice to, to really make this issue a mainstream issue. And while it was me that ran the campaign and found the stories and wrote them, it was a male editor who said, go and do it, um, and I'll back it. And back it he did, um, the, the kind of coverage that money can't buy. And um, you know, that was a man who did that, who drove it, who said, what have you got today? What else can we do? Um, I guess I posed the question, would a sexist news organisation do that? I don't think they would, because I think it would be too confronting for them. It would just be too hard. I think one of the complaints that, that we hear is that uh, across all media, that men's voices are featured more prominently and more often in news coverage. And um, I'll just make this point. As political editor, the people I quote most often are, in my stories, the Prime Minister, currently the Attorney General, the Leader of the Opposition, the Premier, Police Commissioner, Deputy Prime Minister, Leader of the Palmer Party, Chief of the Defence Force, and Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police. And they, they are all currently men. I started in journalism 25 years ago, I was 17 years old when I got my cadetship at the Launceston Examiner in Northern Tasmania. Back then, female editors were very rare. Michelle Grattan was one of the few female role models that we had. Um, today, there are a number of women editing big papers. Um, Michelle Garnett, The Weekend Australian, Rachel Hancock at the Northern Territory News, Kath Weber at the Gold Coast Bulletin, Christine Midapp at the uh, Australian Magazine, Jill at the Sunday Herald Sun, Dushka here at the Sunday Age. And it's much better, it's so much better than it was 25 years ago. But if you look just last night at the uh, Hall of Fame dinner, um, my understanding is there are three women that were um, taken into the Hall of Fame and um, three times that <laughs> uh, of men that three were times. admitted to, to the Hall of Fame. Um, but I just make the point that newsrooms are reflective of society and it's, it's not unique to newsrooms, this situation, that across Australia women are underrepresented at the CEO level, at board level and other senior management positions. Indeed, in Melbourne we had a female Prime Minister and a female Governor General before we got a female President of an AFL club. So why is this? Well, <coughs> Annabel Krabs put the proposition recently that working women need a wife and I agree with her. Um, for years I've watched some of my female colleagues step off the career fast track, either temporarily or permanently, because they chose firstly to have children and then secondly to be the primary caregiver to that child. I think one of the reasons that journalism chews so many people up, male and female, is you can't control it. News doesn't happen nine to five, Monday to Friday. The hard-hitting journalism rounds at state and federal politics, crime, investigations, or working on the news desk require an acceptance that you'll work late with no notice. Your phone will ring day and night. You'll be rostered to work on weekends. Um, you'll find yourself working from home on your days off. And stories will interrupt almost every important event in your life. And in fact, one of our political reporters filed a story for us on the morning of his wedding. Um, because the fact is news won't wait. It won't wait until the next day. And for some women, the decision they've made within their family to raise their children is just incom incompatible with this. Um, you know, hard news journalism means that you cannot get out the door to do the childcare run when there's a leadership spill on or police are launching a terror raid. The Herald Sun offers flexibility, flexibility to all our working parents. So most women come back part-time or at reduced hours uh, when they come back from maternity leave, some work from home. Um, some of them have worked their way back into full-time work, including our female news producers on our desk who are both mothers of young children. Others choose simply not to come back because they find that parenting and full-time hard news reporting is just incompatible. When I was head of news and organising for one of our hard-hitting investigative reporters to come back to work after her second child, the editor's instructions to me were, whatever works from her, for her, work from the office, work from home, I don't care if I never see her, what hours or days she works, just make it work for her. Consequently, this journalist, she stayed engaged with us. She's written front page investigative pieces from home and very shortly she'll return to work full time without missing a beat. She literally did a stake out on a gangster with a baby on her hip. More power to her and to those just like her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. That's fantastic. Could I ask you, Kate?
perhaps to have the next comment. Yes, of course. In fact, I think I'm, I'm very similar to the woman that you've just spoken about in, in terms of really um, building a loyalty with an organisation because that organisation has invested in me and provided me with the flexibility that I need. I worked in commercial broadcasting before I joined the national uh, broadcaster and I've had three children since being at the ABC. And either um, while I was on maternity leave or after the birth of each of uh, my three children, I was promoted. Um, and it's a pretty o incredible organisation that backs a woman who is on maternity leave, knows in fact they will not get, get the benefit of, of them being in the office for potentially eight months, but understands that the long-term investment is important. So for me, the message that that sent to me was that I was valued, that my skills were valued, and that the organisation recognised that I had a life outside the ABC. Um, so for me, that my experience um, has been extraordinary and I understand that that's not everyone's experience and it's certainly not everyone's experience at the ABC too. When I was appointed to this role, um, a lot was made of the fact that I'm the first uh, news director of the ABC and in interviews around uh, my appointment, I actually became quite frustrated by that. I, I was a bit offended uh, that so much focus was placed on that. You know, in my view, I had got that job on merit and I wanted to talk about my vision for ABC News, uh, not my vision as the first female director of ABC News. And I remember about a week after I was appointed, um, I received a, a, a telephone call from a woman that I had worked with in commercial media um, about a decade beforehand. And this was a woman who I had enormous admiration for. Um, she could swing from being an incredible chief of staff to one of your best reporters on the road. She was just one, a, an incredibly competent editorial leader, um, but she was also a great team builder and she was also one of those everyday leaders in a newsroom that everyone would go to for a bit of advice on how to cover a story, etc. And very, out of the blue, she had resigned and she'd gone into uh, PR. And I remember at the time, she was very diplomatic about that. We'd never really got to the bottom of why she'd resigned. So she called me and she said, I've heard you interviewed, I'd, I've heard you talk about uh, the job, and you're clearly un uncomfortable with, with the gender issues. And she said, don't be. She said, I left that news organisation because I was out on a story one day and I was covering state politics and a massive story blew. And the chief of staff rang me with a message from the news director to say that I had to swing back over to a, uh, a story on a book week at a primary school because they had a bloke doing it and it wouldn't be right to have the bloke doing book week when there was such a huge state politics story on. She didn't even fight that. She just made a decision there and then that she didn't have the energy to change that culture. And so she, when she called me, she said, I didn't fight it, but you should be very proud that you have been appointed as a woman and you should absolutely celebrate that because that will encourage the people like me who are experiencing that in newsrooms because it's the reality in some newsrooms, you will encourage them to actually speak up when that happens. And so it completely changed my view. Um, and I think it is really, really important for female leaders in news organisations to stand up and be proud of their leadership positions. I work for a news organisation where if I look at you know, current affairs programs like Four Corners, like uh, um, Australian Story, they are led by incredible female women, uh, f female journalists, um, with great teams of senior female producers around them, amazing female reporters. But they work very closely with great men uh, and I think we've really got to recognise that, um, as Annabel you know, says in her book, it's not about uh, a, a, a women-men's issue. It's absolutely about us as, um, as, as editorial leaders understanding that flexibility across the board is really important. Um, so for me, my experience is, is quite unique. Um, I think, it, it, when I think about how um, editorial decisions are made and whether or not gender affects those editorial decisions, I completely agree with the points that you've made. Um, 
I think we, we all bring our experience to the table, and, um, but I don't think that there are issues uh, around gender in the editorial decision making. Um, I do think there's issues around diversity in the, uh, in the voices that we're hearing from. Um, I remember uh, a number of years ago going to speak to uh, one of the big four banks about the issues that we were having in getting women um, spokespeople rather than men. And we had a very candid conversation about the fact that uh, men were very happy to and very confident about uh, putting their head above the parapet and, and uh, forming a view very quickly around a particular topic. Women were much more cautious and, and much less likely uh, to, at short notice, be available for a television interview or a radio interview. Um, and so I think that's something that as editorial leaders we really need to work hard on. Um, the reality is in a newsroom and particularly in an organisation like the ABC, if you're working for a radio current affairs uh, program or even in, lo in local radio, the pace is extraordinary. So, you know, you, you might enter your program not necessarily um, having filled that whole hour. And uh, so you are looking for talent on the run. And so you are looking at your contacts books. And if your contact books are just filled with the male spokespeople that you've been using for the past 10 years, you're not finding and sourcing the new talent. And I think the 24-hour news cycle does mean that we need to make time. We need to deliberately make time to be, uh, to be broadening that talent pool and ensuring that that talent pool includes women. Um, we found, interestingly, with, um, with News24, a different kind of, of uh, news programming to, uh, to anything we'd, we'd done on the ABC previously, really heavily reliant on a very strong contact book. Um, and we're finding with News24 that a deliberate uh, approach, looking at increasing our diversity, and it's not, that's not just a gender uh, focus, uh, it's, it's also a range of different uh, diversity issues. That's been really, really important uh, for us, but it's also been important for people who are new to the media um, to actually build their confidence about being spokespeople, about being able to, uh, to take part in a debate where they have absolutely the right to have a strong voice, but my otherwise have been a bit uh, cautious uh, about doing so. Um, but I think the kinds of issues that Gail uh, is talking about are really important to call out and I think the Herald Sons campaign has been one of the great campaigns, a very courageous campaign, but also I think it's uplifting in seeing how the community responded. Um, not only uh, you know, the, the, uh, the leaders in the community, but how the community responded to that. Um, and I think we should be encouraged by that. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. And Patricia. The thing is, when you're last, is that people have made a lot of your <laughs> points. You just mm. make them better. Yeah, well, there's that, but look, <laughs> not, not, not with this company, I don't think, but no, I'll give it a go. No. Look, I want to uh, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the land which we, um, uh, well, I'm sitting on uh, right now. Uh, feminism is a guiding philosophy in my life, and gender equality is something I believe we're yet to achieve, but desperately need to. As a woman, obviously, and as a mother of two young girls, I find it frustrating, deeply frustrating, to watch the pathway for women ending in diminished roles, on diminished hours and diminished pay, while men don't experience this all around me. But by the same token, my views on gender representations at high levels in newsrooms across Australia and where I work at News Corp uh, have been a bit more nuanced and shaped by actually very positive experiences of gaining access to power and being offered genuine opportunities to rise within my news organisation. To give this context, I run a large division of the National Broadsheet as Victorian Bureau Chief. There's about 30 journalists that work under me, and I'm at the centre of much of the paper's national affairs reporting because I've continued to be a journalist because I cannot help myself. <laughs> uh, I, I've got to say I was offered that job when I was... Um, uh, six weeks pregnant or something. You don't usually tell people you're six weeks pregnant, but I did tell my boss, again, that paranoia, I, would, <laughs> I found out I'm pregnant with my second child, and he said, I don't care. Do you care? And I said, no, I don't care at all. I just thought you might care. And um, <laughs> no one cared, and I've continued, and I had the baby, threw it at my partner, threw her at my partner, and um, continued uh, filing in la while I was in labour, um, <laughs> which distracted me from the pain, so it was fine. Uh, <laughs> 
the, but, you know, while I have these very positive experiences, I've got to say there are still too many, too few female editors or women in positions of power across the media. And I think it's right that we acknowledge that and start to have a serious conversation about why that might be. Uh, my view, however, is that the reasons behind this are much more systemic uh, rather than being necessarily the news organisation's entire responsibility and there's no quick fix. The reasons are plain and Annabelle did raise these in her book and I couldn't agree more. Women are still shouldering the bulk of the domestic load. They're raising the children as primary caregivers while the gendered household means men are still the main bread earners. To be uh, the main female bread earner, as I very proudly am, is the exception to the rule. While I accept that some women, including journalists, actively want to play this primarily home-based role and don't seek promotion necessarily after having children, I st still think many women end up in this role because they think it's the only role that they're destined to be in because everything they've seen modelled before them is that that's what they must do. So I think that's something we need to tackle uh, more than anything and it starts a lot earlier than I, I can tell you than at 30. Um, I've already seen our newsrooms become better at accommodating women. As Ellen said, these are some of the points that I may, you may have heard before, but I'll try and reframe them. Uh, journalism is a career that's all about the story. I don't care where reporters are as long as they deliver the story. And I, I actually have a lot of men, uh, just as it turns out, working for me in the Melbourne Bureau. And actually, a lot of the, those men uh, require flexibility. I have one colleague who you know, does the kid drop-off every morning. And he's always really conscious of that and says, it calls me and says, oh, oh I'm going to try and get a story for your news list. And I say, just get a yarn. I don't care where you are. Like, get the girls to school. I really don't care. But I do need a splash for tomorrow. <laughs> and so at some point, you're going to have to deliver it. But I'm not really necessarily concerned about where you are on the road right now. Um, but while the numbers at the top are still not equal, uh, there are now more women in positions of power. And we were saying this earlier and back there. We need to actually celebrate that rather than just sort of feeling miserable. Uh, my paper has a female weekend editor in Michelle Gunn, a managing editor in Helen Trinker, women I, I respect and work very well with, and, um, and a national chief of staff. I also obviously run the biggest bureau outside of head office, and you may have noticed I'm a woman. Um, the question I was asked to address for this talk was, are newsroom sexist? The sexism I've witnessed in newsrooms, and I have experienced or seen sexism, is the same sexism I see throughout the rest of our culture, funnily enough. Newsrooms are not immune from sexism, but nor do they breed more sexism, I believe, than anywhere else. Uh, they've changed vastly also in my years as a journalist. The newsroom in my paper is not a blokey newsroom. Uh, there's no way I would have tolerated that kind of environment, believe me. I was asked to address whether gender power or imbalance in the newsroom affects news agendas. Do men pick different stories or sources and experts than women? I have to say from watching this closely, and I'm fairly obsessed with this sort of stuff, so I do watch it closely, I don't think so. I certainly don't think it's overt. If it happens, it's m at much more of a subconscious level. For instance, I'll give you an example. I push stories about childcare. I find it both an interesting national political uh, story and a policy story, but it's also something, there's no doubt, the, Part of the obsession is that it impacts very dominantly in my life uh, and my ability to work and my partner's ability to work as well in, in a part-time role. Uh, but my male editor, Clive Matheson, is also obsessed with childcare stories <laughs> and ensures they receive, receive prominence for equally the same reasons. It's a good yarn, but he's also, um, at the coalface, he's a working father. Uh, his experience is also guided by having those young children. So... You know, when you start scratching, you find that men are, uh, especially in more equal households, are finding that they're having the same sorts of issues. Um, so I contest the notion that women, women somehow have a universal womanness that means they take an interest in different stories or have different sources per se. I think each editor brings their own unique interests and news values to a role, regardless of gender. Uh, my passion for wanting more women to rise is not based on some idyllic notion that the news, patients, news pages would become bastions of feminine issues and flowers and fragrances. It's because I actually believe in equality. So I think the newsrooms should be equally balanced because, you know, we're over 50% of the population, so why wouldn't we be running more stuff? Most newsrooms have a very highly developed news interest and agendas based on their audience and history. And this is something Ellen was talking about, you know, you know your audience. 
Uh, my white editor-in-chief believes in prioritising Indigenous affairs, for instance, and he's not Aboriginal, and yet he wants Aboriginal stories on the front page all the time. Uh, there are men, as we've seen at the Herald Sun, who want to take the issue of violence against women and make it a front page news story. This is a good thing. In the last five years, we've seen the reporting of domestic violence transform, and I believe it will continue to do so. It is now being given much more prominence, and this is a result of major changes to the way we're thinking. It is about the lobbying and the education of journalists and about the community, but it's, it's a good thing, and it's, you know, society changes. That's the point. We evolve, we learn, and we correct mistakes, you know. We don't put nude girls on page three. We, we learn from the mistakes we've made in the past, and we alter it, and we, we do our jobs better, I believe. Ultimately, then, it's about the people you appoint not the gender per se. Not all women would put Indigenous affairs stories or stories about violence against women on the front page, but neither would all men. The best newsrooms are the ones that put the right people in the editorial roles to ensure that systemic issues, including gendered violence, are given proper and prominent treatment. Good editors understand that they must lead strong newsrooms that get to the heart of exploitation, corruption and violence. My view is that there are just as many women who are capable of doing that as men, and that's the issue. I would like to see more women in leadership positions in both newsrooms and uh, in every other part of the world, because ultimately journalists report on the world, so it'd be good to quote more women in positions of power as well. But the conversation we need to be having is one that starts much, much earlier, when women are girls. I was able to have a very... In I'm able to have a very intense working role because my partner does the pickups and the mealtimes and the bedtime stories. But this hasn't been accidental. I have actively sought that role. My advice to young women is not to be ambivalent about power and not to assume any role. Children and high-level careers in newsrooms are very possible. My bosses are always looking to promote women. The reality is that not all women want to be promoted or feel like they can meet their dual obligations, so they decline opportunities in some cases. That's difficult to watch. Newsrooms must become better at accommodating the different needs of their workforce, particularly women, but also there are other diverse groups. At the same time, we need to unlock the social ru rules that are routinely placing women in the home and not asking them if that's really where they want to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, very interesting discussions and, uh, and, and views and experiences from our three uh, panellists. Before I um, throw it open to the floor, if I could you know, take the chair's privilege, and um, it's very interesting that uh, you, you all uh, feel that there are very powerful women who are involved in news, um, news and news decisions, and uh, but underlying it, uh, there is this uh, sense uh, of reflecting the real world, which is still somewhat sexist. I guess um, the kind of questions that we've been trying to interrogate is the extent to which the external realities of who does what at home and what impact that has on how women feel they have choices or not and, and, and so on does actually um, affect the top decision makers and so how subtle this is. Now I'm, I'm hearing sort of two things in a sense. One is it hasn't held you back, that you've got really fabulous, that really just being a good journalist where, it's, you know, where, where it lies. But on the other hand, to be a really good journalist, you can't have a in any kind of uh, the sort of gender roles that are out there in society for most women and most men. Um, could, would any of you like to comment on, you know, you, you've all said there should be more women. How do you think it might happen? Well, I, I think I think you made a really interesting point, and we talked a bit beforehand about um, uh, about women wanting to step up. And you know, for individuals will make re uh, make decisions for a range of different reasons. Um, but I think there's something about that. I think there's something about. Um, women sometimes not wanting uh, to, you know, to put their head above the parapet and step into uh, the, the leadership roles beyond uh, the daily uh, hands-on. Why and do I think you there's think something that is, that's, Well, that's, there's something I think, that I think more broadly you see that as well. That's all about, uh, you know, why aren't there more uh, female CEO, CEOs? That's absolutely about us as a society making a decision to make that happen. 
but we also make, need to make sure that women are absolutely ready to do that as well. And, um, but I think we need to respect that some women won't and that's completely okay. For me, I, th I feel very strongly about recognising that everyday leadership that exists um, across your organisation. I think for me, if I look back at the people who have been most influential in my careers, you know, yes, it's often um, a, a boss, um, but more often than not, it's a colleague who does not have a leadership title. And, uh, and I've had conversations with, uh, with women, um, uh, you know, who, who I consider mentors about why they haven't taken the next step. And they don't recognise that they are leaders. So sometimes the most influential person in a newsroom is uh, a senior reporter who just is incredibly wise, in incredibly professionally generous, and quietly mentors a range of people in that newsroom. And I think there's something about recognising that and developing that and developing the confidence to encourage those people to step into formal leadership roles. It's going to be completely okay if some choose not to, but you absolutely know that those people have innate leadership skills um, that ultimately would be incredible at an executive table, but they don't recognise th that in themselves. They just see that as, you know, just part of what they do on a daily basis. So I think recognising that is terribly important and it exists in every part of the organisation. And again, if I look back over my career, um, yeah, the, the key influences for me have often not been the people who are my managers or, or my boss. It's absolutely those, those leaders um, and key influences. Mm. Can I just ask one other question before I go to the floor, which is, um, it's, it's so interesting that, you know, having just spent all, you know, the last six months deep in the literature review of people who've done massive meta-studies around the world and, and your experience coming directly from your mouths is different from what they're saying. I don't know whether it's because, you know, you, you are three women who have made it and have, I, I, oh, but you're also describing workplaces that are unlike what's been in the media, what, what's been in the literature. Can I ask you, and I'm not trying to prove a point because obviously we're actually doing research in newsrooms as we mm. speak to find out what's happening, so we're going to be doing our own research. Um, but with things like the Hunt family near Wagga Wagga, you know, this is the, uh, the man who killed, who murdered his wife and his three children and then killed himself. And the media coverage of that uh, was really, by and large, he was an upstanding citizen, which, of course, they were hearing from people around him. But even in the editorial part of it was, oh, it must have been hard because she was disabled or did he have depression or... Um, and even writing things like here, is, uh, here are the neighbours looking at him and his little family in the grave and, you know, this sad, you know, these five sad deaths rather than this man is a man who perpetrated terrible violence on his family. And that kind of language, I guess you would have to say, is not really appropriately respectful of an epidemic that we're having in this country. Where does that come from, do you think? Was that bad journalism? Or is that an over, overhang, I suppose, from a more sexist past? Ellen? Yeah, you're Alan's like... passionate about this one. Yeah, yeah I am. I, um, I follow this stuff really carefully and particularly how we cover it because yeah. of my interest through Take a Stand. And um, I, other than one feature, all of our copy came from um, New South Wales. But um, what Gail says is um, quite right in the way it, it, was, it was quite respectful to the, um, to, to the man. Um, so I thought, well, why is this? I need to have a look as to, as to why this is. And I think what the journalists did is take their lead from the people um, around them because the woman who was murdered, her sister um, spoke to the media, and this, this is a woman in complete shock and trauma, but her initial reaction to that was, um, he's such a good man, I don't understand why he would do this. Um, this is a terrible tragedy, I, I forgive him almost. Um, and I think the journos, that, uh, looking at it remotely, I didn't do those stories, but looking at it, I think that they took their lead off that. And it took three or four days um, before the reality sunk in that actually this was a, a murder of um, three children and a wife. Um, and then, yes, he killed himself. But, but what Gail says, that what I found um, very um, disturbing, I think, in the, 
in the way that story then came across as um, people were analysing what made him do it while well, he was under a great stress because she'd had an accident and she had an acquired brain injury. So he was under stress because of what had happened to her. And, you know, all she did was have an accident and get a brain injury and take time to recover. Um, and you find this over and over again when um, there, there was a case in court this week where a man killed his, um, he killed his wife and the defence counsel put up the argument that he was under great stress because he was being investigated over a 30-year-old rape allegation. And I've written two editorials about this where the response is always, um, I did this because um, of what she did, or I was under stress. Um, so the way that, that it could be perceived on the Hunt reporting was that um, because he'd had such a difficult time caring for her and having to raise these children that he reacted because of that. Um, and, and you'll see it over and over again, and I do spend hours reading these things and, mm. lo and looking at it over and over again. It's how the defence lawyers do it, um, and I'm afraid on this occasion, for the first couple of days, it's how the media handled the Hunt case. Mm. Um, would anyone like to ask a question now? We've got quite a few, I think, so just wait, if you don't mind, till the microphone comes, because, as you know, we're recording this. Here, at, over here. Hi. I, um, I wanted maybe the panellists to speak a little bit more, because although, Gail, I agree, and I don't disagree with anything anyone's really said in, in large part, and I agree that it does look like it's contradicting the literature, but at the same time, it's not. I feel like the parts that you've talked about in terms of sexism and how it translates the media industry and women, whether women think they've got leadership qualities, all that sort of thing, that to me is the crux of it. And we kind of go, oh, men aren't punching women in the face in the newsroom and throwing them out and saying you can't have the job, therefore it's all okay. But I'd love for you to expand on what you're raising, which are subtle and, like Patricia said, nuanced, but I think are quite powerful in women making decisions not to take roles or, like Patricia said, maybe not feeling that they know how to manage their lives and we're going, step up. And it's like, who's there to help them learn how to balance that? Where are the role models that Patricia's talking about that you go, who else is doing this and how do I do it? So I'd love if you could talk yeah, a bit look, more about that. I've got views on that. I, I actually do think it's about leadership and modelling by other women. And that's why I kind of ended, I wrote my speech because I was quite passionate about this topic. I really do pour over it because I see, I feel very lonely sometimes <laughs> because I feel like all of, a lot of my friends that I started with are now sort of working part time and in different roles. And sometimes I get a bit, yeah, I have to hang out with the boys again. And they're fine. Like, look, I get along with them all, but it's just sometimes you do feel <laughs> the old one out, particularly as a primary bread earner as well, especially if you go back to work when you have a baby, that's sort of unusual, so you do feel it. Uh, but I know that we have, as an organisation, without naming people and being specific, tried to promote women. They've been offered roles and they've not wanted to because of their home roles. I think some of that has been genuine, as we were talking about before, like, like they want to be with their baby and I think that's fine. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be with your baby. They're very cute, if anyone's had one. Um, they're lovely to stay with, but I think part of it is that the sexism is so ingrained that they couldn't possibly imagine that at that, that crucial point in your late 20s, early 30s, where you either make it or don't, or, or coast, or it's sort of a different, you know, you step up or not, that the male partner keeps stepping up. And I, I see this everywhere, and I want to bash my head against the wall because I don't actually get it. Because these are often women I've, that are much smarter than me, that I grew up with, that are really quite brilliant. And I think about all those degrees and all those years on the newsroom floor and I think two days on sort of, you know, in advertorials isn't really the right place for you, you know? I, somewhere else would be the right place for you and what, what's wrong with the construction that's made that happen? And I do think it's because of the home... I think the home balance is all wrong. That's what I think. You can't separate the home from the workplace, they're interlinked, and I do think that. But I've got to say one more thing about modelling. Um, so I do work full-time, and that's a choice, and I quite like it. And there are times where it's tiring, just like Annabelle argues about men, they need to get a life. I feel like that about myself sometimes. I think, these women are at the park with their kids, and here I am again, you know, pouring over another yarn or, t you know, trying to sort of construct something. Uh, and uh, that frustrates me, but I think we have to also realise that that those decisions are made very individually by different women 
And as long as they know that there are their doors open, and the doors are really wide open, not just a bit sort of, you know, a bit of a light, but really wide open, they can make very active decisions about that. And I think it will keep changing and there'll be more of us and, you know, we'll be has-beens. I think um, I couldn't agree more, but I, I think um, I don't think any of us want to present a Pollyannish view of, around newsrooms. But I do think the issues that we face in newsrooms and news organisations are the issues that are faced in most organisations. And I was telling the panel before about um, one of my experiences whereby um, I'd gone back to work and I had a, a baby and a five year old, and my five year old had just started school. And I was working with a male colleague, uh, and he had a, 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 a school-aged child as well and so we decided that we would work and we happily negotiated with the ABC that we would work early. We would start at six o'clock so we could go and do school pickup um, and he's a very senior um, uh, male colleague and I would walk out the door and one of our colleagues would, every time I would walk out the door, he would say, oh, early, oh, interesting, okay. Mm. And my male colleague would, would out, walk out the door and he'd say, see you buddy, see you tomorrow. And I just, I, I was so frustrated with myself that I let it get under my skin. I just was so annoyed by this. And so I, for three days in a row, rang him at 6 a.m. to say, hi, just letting you know, I'm just going into work now. What are you up to? <laughs> um, and with that, it stopped. But I thought, uh, he was also a colleague that I really, I really admired and and he would have been mortified if I'd walked into his office and said, I feel that this is a gender issue and it's appalling. He would have been mortified by that. I just think it's about calling it out, but calling it out in a really gracious way. Because I think, I think to kind of go to war is, is counterproductive. And so, uh, you know, I'm not pretending that sexism doesn't exist at the ABC. Um, but I do, I do think that there is a commitment to ensuring that we have uh, a respectful workplace and, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that the issues that you have in a news organisation are different to the issues that we all want to change in the broader community. Um, Patricia? Yeah, I just wanted to say, it's also about a broader modelling, like journalism is, Ellen said, it's unpredictable and stories happen all the time. And, the way I deal with that is actually to be quite... I will file a story from anywhere. I don't care if it's a good enough story. I have criteria. Um, but I will actually tell ministers who I have very good relationships with and, you know, I have kind of... This is kind of what I do is a lot of politics I cover that I'm actually with my baby now. Like, I, you know, you've got to be quite upfront with people and your bosses. I've got... Can you hear her? Yeah, the three-year-old's screaming. So I can interview you or get this from you or find out this or whatever you're doing. But... Let me just... Man like, putting it in people's face, people have to know that this is actually the way the world works and I very actively do that, mm. really consciously. I, like, I, I'm just going to get my partner to get the baby. I can't talk to you for another 40 minutes. So I'm not, you know, at your beck and call. I've got to manage the kid and, oh, okay, oh, oh, have you got the kid? Oh. Yeah, because, you know, I have one. <laughs> you know, I have one and now I've got to do something with her and then I'll call you back because I want the story and I want to talk to you and I want to find out, you know, who's doing who and what's happening. I used to be very <laughs> anxious about that until um, I, I used to EP Insiders until one um, weekend I got a call on a Saturday and my husband called... I was outside and my husband called me and we had two phones and, um, and it was a Prime Minister. And so I went to the phone... And to my horror, my five-year-old was on the, the other line. <laughs> <laughs> and they were having a lovely... Call. And I was so mortified. And he was so lovely about it. And, from the, you know, we're human. You know, that's the reality. We have a life and, you know, meet Ruby, Prime <laughs> Minister. <laughs> I can remember Actually, lining. Ruby's got some views about kindergarten <laughs> yeah, funding. Right. <laughs> yes, wants to ask them. Uh, my questions. daughter often does that. Well, they fund my school a bit better, <laughs> Mum. We'll raise that next time. <laughs> right daughter. Yeah. But I can remember when my middle daughter was about two or something... I had to take her with me. I was um, I was with Catalyst or with the, with the equivalent, and um, we were I lived all around the country with the crew. And at one stage, I had a nanny. At one stage, we were filming, and the sound is going. There's this terrible noise, a wailing noise in the in the. Um, anyway, of course, it was my daughter crying about three paddocks away. <laughs> <laughs> we had to remove her. Anyway, another. Uh, I'm sort of uh, picking up just sort of a sort of an unspoken thing that seems to be sort of coming through what everybody's saying, and it's. It's kind of a whatever it takes kind of attitude to, to the newsroom and to stories and to newspapers. And personally, for me, sort of looking at future careers, that would be intimidating if I had a family. And I wonder how much that sort of 
attitude um, intimidates women? Journalism's not easy. Um, it's a wonderful job and it, it's a wonderful life and I, I think most journos who've been around a long time, they don't say to you, I do journalism, they say, I am a journalist. Um, and it's very much part of, it's not, it's not just what you do to get paid, it's, it's what makes you tick, it's, it's how you look at the world, it's all of those things. Um, and there, there are periods through that that are, look, I'm afraid they are very difficult. Um, you know, it's given me some wonderful opportunities over my life, but I've also seen some terrible things and I work, you know, really quite intense hours, which, you know, these guys do too. And, and it, it, but it ebbs and flows over the, over the course of your career, I think. Um, and there are things you can do that are not quite whatever it takes. Mm. It's just if you want to be right where it's at, if you want to be writing the first draft of history, um, right at some of those kind of moments, or if, if you want to be, if you want to run the ABC or you want to edit the Australian or edit the Herald Sun, that there are a number of years where you're going to have to um, accept the fact that there is just a lot that you're going to have to do after hours. There are hard things you're going to have to do. It's it can be a very, very difficult job. That said, that said, it really is an amazing job. And if you're considering it, you know, don't let anything that we've said put you off because mm. it, it can be a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, there are, there are going to be times where it's absolutely all-encompassing. But um, I was on a panel in Sydney a few weeks ago and um, uh, a woman uh, stood up and asked a question and says, you know, I'm just um, going back to, to journalism after my second child and you know I'm going back three days a week but I kind of just think am I ever going to get that correspondence job if I go back three days a week and I just and I just wanted to go and hug her and say relax chill out you know step back there are going to be times in your life whether you're in journalism or any other industry um, that you know we have to be more comfortable about making those decisions if that's right for us and and it really sounded as though it was right for her at that point in time to just ease up a bit um, and I think Alan's absolutely right. You will make decisions um, if you need to that, in fact, you know, you want to, you want to work in a part of a, a news organisation that allows you greater flexibility than another part of the news organisation. If you're a Four Corners reporter and you're working on a Four Corners story, then that is your life. And um, that's not probably going to be a great thing to do when you're, uh, you know, when you've got a 12-month-old, I don't know. Uh, it's just you make decisions and there are parts of, of the news organisation that will provide more flexibility than other parts. Can I, I know that we've only got about a minute. I just very quickly want to ask, the construction of legacy media, newspapers, uh, uh, TV, radio, as they are, um, is, not, is hostile to family in it because of the way in which we're working. Do you think that new media, online publishing, whilst it's put pressure for the 24-hour news cycle, opens other avenues for greater flexibility that is actually more friendly to the kind of things that women have traditionally been valuing? It, well, yeah, in terms of shift work, like, uh, you know, I don't mean to sound too, too dismissive mm. of it, but yes, in terms of mm. shift work. But again, if you want to, if you want to take a startup and, and turn it into something, or if you, if you want to, you know, edit news.com or, you know, some of the, the big ones, you, you're really going to have to do a lot of work to do that. Um, mm. No, it does provide flexibilities, though. I mean, I, mm. I construct, you know, I'm the news editor in Victoria, and, you know, I, I can organise my entire morning at home with the kids and direct people mm. and crews and I, you know, the, you know, the terror raids happened, I was sending people out and photographers everywhere mm. and mm. I was with my kids because I'd take them to childcare but constructing the news list, reading everything I could, I had access to everything because mm. of technology and mm. my smartphone. Mm. So I wouldn't have been able to do that 10, mm. 15, 20 years mm. ago. So yeah, it has opened up opportunities. Yeah. So, and I did a very good job. We, we, kicked ass the next day you know it was fine there yes. was no problem so it, there are it, do, it can help some people find that encroaches I know some people like to turn off their phone and don't like it I actually I love work I love stories I don't care if they interrupt my family life my family now is used to it like it's just kind of part of how we live but I understand some people don't and that's that's fine but you know for those of us for me it's an opportunity not a uh, uh, not it doesn't get in my way it just gives me another platform mm. okay yeah no I, I absolutely agree I mean I just think the flexibility that technology has given us um, but you've got to have a culture too an, an organizational culture that embraces that and uh, and I think we have um, but I think there are opportunities Okay, like I want to thank, uh, we could talk all day uh, because we've only just scratched the surface about what constitutes choice and, you know, um, it, it, but it's fabulous to hear what you've got to say and it's inspirational to be sitting with three such fabulous journalists who happen to be women. Um, so I'd like to thank very much Kate Tawney, Ellen Wynette and Patricia Cavallis.
for speaking with us today, taking the time out. Please join me in uh, thanking our three fabulous panellists.